Hi everyone, welcome to Water Bear Reads, where I discuss illustrated classics and modern classics. My name is Heather, I'm so glad you're here. Before I begin, I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone who has subscribed to my channel over the last couple of weeks. Your support is invaluable to me, and every time I see a new subscriber, I get so much confidence. So I just wanted to say thank you, thank you so much. I was, I hope you enjoyed those animals at the beginning of this video. One morning I was having coffee and looking out my kitchen window, and there was a little skunk that was going back into its hole, which is under our house. And then the, uh, the otter and the mink, we, my son and I were hiking at um, a local wildlife refuge one Sunday morning. Um, and we were just sitting there enjoying an otter and then finally got up to leave and there ca out came a little mink. And it was just jumping around us as if we weren't there. It was, it's my first time seeing a mink in the wild. So I was very excited about that. Today, I wanted to chat about another one of my son and my lists where we read illustrated classics by the decade. So we'll read one from the 1900s, one from the 1910s, 1920s, and so on, as well as one from 1800s or earlier. I wanted to just say before I get into it, these videos tend to run long. Um, I think my last one, my second read a book by the decade was 50 minutes long, and I'm so sorry about that. I just didn't realize it was gonna go so long. So I've decided to give myself a limit on each book, and that's it. So I'm gonna try and stick to that limit. But yeah, grab yourself a cozy beverage and we'll get started. And the first one is Aesop's Fables. I always feel like I want to read Aesop's Fables in the spring, and I guess it's because you're coming out of winter, you've been reading these heavy books during the winter time, and I wanna get out in the garden, and I have so much pulling at my time during the spring. And it's great to have small, short little stories that we can go over and read. Another reason I love to read this in the spring is because I always feel kind of a pull towards nature, a pull towards animals, and most of the tales are anthropomorphized animals. And something about reading Aesop's fables makes me feel like I'm enjoying nature even more. I have a couple of versions here. This is my unabridged version, illustrated by Nora Fry. Almost every page is illustrated. This fable, by the way, is from a fable I really enjoy where all these mice get together to decide what to do about a cat that's terrorizing them. And they decide, well, we'll just put a bell around its neck and then we'll know when it's coming. And everyone's so excited about this idea. And then one older mouse gets up and says, okay, this is a great idea. I'm sure it'll be successful, but who's putting the bell around the cat's neck? I always love that fable. I think it's really cute. The I also have this illustrated version by Helen Ward and really kind of reflects that spring feeling. For example, here's the hair from the tortoise and the hare, and they're just beautiful, beautiful illustrations. So it'll have a, a full page illustration, and then it will have the story behind it. Another one, it's really beautiful. Oh, it's just such a gorgeous version. Now we're in the 1900s to the 1910s, and the book I have for you is, of course, The Wind in the Willows. The events in The Wind in the Willows occur year round. There's even a really beautiful Christmas portion to it. But I think reading it in the spring is just amazing because, you know, everyone knows. It starts off with Mole, who's doing spring cleaning, saying that he wants to get outdoors and experience life, and he doesn't want to be stuck indoors anymore, and so off he goes, and so begins our story. This was one of the first books that I actually ever read to my son, and it was quite difficult. He was a bit too young for it. So what I would do was I would read a chapter and then watch that portion of what we just read, um, I'd pull up the show on YouTube. I'll, I'll link it below to sh and show you ex the exact version. And we'd watch what we just read, what he was doing. I think he was four, which is just too early <laughs> to, read, to read Wind in the Willows, but I was just so gung-ho. I read it again to him a little bit later, and then it was m way more successful without anything to help it along. It does have some really exciting bits, especially the part with Toad and how crazy Toad is about that automobile. My son just really loved those bits. And also at the end, when they go to defend Toad Hall and take back Toad Hall from the weasels, my son really loved that part, the battle at the end. So there's some really exciting bits as well. I love this version illustrated by Ernest Shepard. There's a little illustration under the dust jacket and there's a map 
on the end papers. This one is full color illustrations. So there's one of them right there for you. And of one of my son's favorite parts towards the end when they're taking back Toad Hall. Published in 1911 is The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. And this version is illustrated by Lauren Child. I love Lauren Child. I have a couple of her classics. And I did a blog post about her as well, which I'll link below if you're interested in seeing some of her other classics. It's definitely um, a great book to read in the spring. It has spring vibes not only because of spring actually taking place, but because two of the characters are going through a metamorphosis, especially Colin, who has been sheltered and cradled his whole life and believes himself to be sick and ill and not capable of doing things that other children are capable of doing. And he comes to learn that he can do all these things and he grows and he becomes... The Colin storyline for me is the, the most excellent storyline. It's so beautiful. Also, by the way, it's a great book for both girls and boys because two of the characters are boys, Colin and Dickon, and my son was just as interested in them, and I'm, The Secret Garden is one of his favorite books. This version is so pretty. So first of all, you have the end papers, and this one also opens up. There's a door there, and then it's illustrated with these color illustrations. And then on the other side, there's a, decora a decoration from one of the materials that Lauren Child used in her collages. She makes these collages and she also illustrates them with pen and ink and acrylics and watercolor and such. But there's also these interior illustrations as well. So I really like this version. But yeah, so this is The Secret Garden from 1911. Published in 1922 is The Velveteen Rabbit. And I love just the plain original William Nicholson illustrations because I feel like they're so iconic. Almost the same way that Ernest Shepard is for Winnie the Pooh. I feel that way about the Velveteen Rabbit. Um, there are so many illustrated versions of this story though out there and they're all so beautiful. I think I found this one in a book box actually. So I do want to upgrade and get a proper Velveteen Rabbit and a hardback copy. You know, just looking at this book makes me emotional. <laughs> um, I know a lot of people think of The Velveteen Rabbit as more perhaps of a Christmas book, but I always think of spring when I read this book because first of all, the rabbit becomes real in spring when the boy decides that he's real. And then he becomes real again later when a tear falls on the ground and a flower grows up and there's a fairy in it who makes him a real rabbit. And then finally, at the very end of the story, the boy recognizes, or maybe not recognize, but he sees this bunny that looks a lot like his velveteen rabbit looked. And so I feel, for me, it's, it always feels more of a spring book. Here are some interior illustrations. So there's the skin horse and the velveteen rabbit. They're just so beautiful and timeless. It's one of my best friend's favorite books. It's one of my favorite books. By the way, if you want to listen to it on audio, Meryl Streep does an audio recording of it. I love Meryl Streep. I really loved her audio version. So now we are in the 1930s and the book I want to share with you, I actually shared with you on my very first Read a Book by the Decades video. I couldn't leave this one out because it does have such spring vibes. Mary Poppins from 1934 and I love this version by Lauren Child. I showed you her secret garden just now and let me show you some of the interior. So here's in the beginning when it's kind of winter and there's no leaves on the tree and at the end we have this illustration where the cherry trees are blooming and it ends in spring as Mary Poppins goes away. It's so spring-like. This is a great version, but do keep in mind it has only seven of the chapters out of the 12 chapters. The chapters that you find in here are kind of the same ones that would be similar to the Disney version of the movie. And, um, oh, which brings me to mind, I wanted to tell you, so I was watching Laura over at Why the Book Wins, and she has a channel where she compares books with their movie adaptations, and she did a video on Mary Poppins, which I'll link below. And 
it got me to thinking because when I read Mary Poppins the first time, I really didn't like it. I was kind of, I kind of didn't like Mary Poppins the character. <laughs> and I thought that the events that were happening in the book were kind of weird. And I just really didn't like it. And then I'm not sure why, but I decided to give it a reread and I reread it, the original version with all the, the chapters. And I loved it so much. I feel like you kind of have to de disney yourself from this story in order to enjoy it. Disney takes over a book, they make a, an amazing film out of it, and then it just becomes a life of its own that sort of eclipses the original story. So yeah, and I can sort of understand why P.L. Travers put up such a fight against Disney taking her book and turning it into that, because I think she probably had a sense that that would happen. If you read it and you find you don't like it, do give it another try because it is such a wonderful story on the second read. So now we are in the 1940s and written in 1941, I have Paddle to the Sea by Holling Clancy Holling. And this is a library copy, but I actually would love to add this to my bookshelves one day. Paddle to the Sea starts out in the spring when a young boy carves a canoe and at the very bottom he carves Please put me back in the water, I am paddled to the sea. And then he sticks him in a snowdrift, which is melting into the stream, and off goes Paddle to the Sea on his journey through the Great Lakes region. Here's an illustration of Paddle's journey. So Paddle goes through the Great Lake region to the Atlantic Ocean, and on the way he gets help from other humans, and he sees animals running away from a forest fire, he goes over Niagara Falls, and countless adventures happen to him as he makes his way through the Great Lakes to the ocean. I love this book, not only because it's so inventive, I love this idea, but I also love this, I this book because it's a great geography lesson, and it also talks about the history of the region, but I also love this book because so many people come together to help this toy reach the sea. Here's one of them who picks it up, puts a fresh bottom on it, and carves a little bit more about where it had stopped. And along the way, other people carve where they picked it up and then put it back in the water. And eventually it does make itself to the ocean. So here you can see his journey. He begins all the way up here and he just carries on through here and he goes through all the lakes and eventually comes out up here through the bay and goes out into the ocean. And that's, by the way, about around about where I am. So yeah, I highly recommend this one. It's, and it's a quick read. And every page is, has a beautiful full page illustration. So it's a great one to read to younger readers too. So Paddle to the Sea, 1940. So now we're in the 1950s and the book I have for you from 1956 is The Enormous Egg by Oliver Butterworth. Illustrated by Louis Darling with gorgeous black and white illustrations. We have the Twitchell family living in Freedom, New Hampshire. And one day on their farm, they look in the chicken coop and there is this huge egg. And they don't know what's inside this egg, but they look after it and eventually it hatches and it is a baby Triceratops. And so the adventure begins as Nate enjoys a lot of attention from his friends. But as the dinosaur grows larger, Nate has to come up with ways of caring for this dinosaur. And it actually ends up being um, kind of an, a great book for teaching children about business and about business decisions and money and uh, affordability of things. I thought it had some really good valuable lessons um, in it. And let me show you some of the, of course it happens in the spring when um, the, the eggs are hatching, the dinosaur right after it has hatched. It's, it has some really funny circumstances that happen. So if you have a kid that's into dinosaurs, they'll really enjoy this. From the 1950s, published in 1961, is Owls in the Family by Farley Mowat, illustrated by Robert Frankenberg. This one is set in May, and it's a late spring. And there's still snow on the ground, and it's set in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in Canada. And we follow a boy who, with his friends, find an owl that has fallen from the nest after a really bad late spring storm and rescues the owl and takes it home with him. And then a couple of weeks later, rescues another owl who is um, kind of being bullied by some other boys. 
and it's just about their adventures with these two owls and their family now. It's such a wonderful book, um, but I will say it, it's a book of its time. There are some outdated ideas, one of which is the old idea of taking things from the wild and keeping them as pets, you know? I mean, in this case, he kept the owl because it fell from the tree and it no longer could survive without him. And the other owl that was found was on the brink of death and he brought him back. But yeah, but these boys are running around and they're just, whatever they feel like taking from nature, they take from nature and make them their pets. It was back from those days. It's wonderful to revisit and, and it just gives you such wonderful vibes of the old days of, of, you know, of adventures of kids just getting out there and being outdoors and climbing trees and going on adventures and pretending things and make-believing. At one stage, they're lost and they are thirsty, so they start make-believing that they're in the Sahara Desert. And great illustrations. Here's one that I thought was a little bit spring-like with the hair. And there's just so many funny parts, too, that make it so much fun to read. The owl here, the great horned owl, is named Wool after Owl and uh, Winnie the Pooh. And so I thought that was really cute that there was a Winnie the Pooh reference as well. I love Farley Mowat's work. Uh, he wrote The Dog Who Wouldn't Be, and I have um, another one of his stories in a book I have called Great Canadian Animal Stories. And his story is the best of the lot, in my opinion. But yeah, um, 1961, Owls and the Family. So now we're in the 1970s, and published in 1970 is my favorite of E.B. White's books, and it is The Trumpet of the Swan. I love E.B. White, I love all of his books, but I really like The Trumpet of the Swan. And we read this version by Edward Fraschino, and I just love this book. It's another one that's a fantastic geography lesson because it starts in Canada, and then takes place over so much of the USA, even going to Boston Public Gardens, which I thought was just fantastic. A boy who goes with his dad to the Canadian wilderness, and while exploring, he comes across a nest of trumpet swans. At first, the trumpet swans are suspicious of him, but after a while, they relax and they allow him to hang around. At one point, he even saves their lives. Eventually, the eggs hatch, and among the cygnets are Louis. And Louis has a bit of a problem with his voice where he can't make that trumpeting call that the swans are famous for. And his parents are worried that he's never going to find a mate. And so his father robs a music store one day <laughs> and steals a trumpet. And because they're good swans and they know that if they took something, then they should pay the money for it, Louis embarks on um, a mission to earn money to pay the music store back for this trumpet that was stolen for his benefit. And he goes on all kinds of adventures and he has a, an, another swan that he's in love with and he's trying to earn her as his mate. And it's just really beautiful. We read this once, and then we probably listened to it, the audio version by E.B. White. His voice is just so wonderful. And these illustrations by Edward Fraschino are great. There's another one who illustrates it, whose name I'm forgetting at the moment. I'll put it up on the screen for you so you can see it. But this is Edward Fraschino's. This is when Louis the Swan rescues a boy at camp and so that was a really good part. Make sure you have a music source nearby. Not only is it a lesson in geography, but it's also a lesson in music. As Louis plays different pieces of music, you can listen to what he's playing. Highly recommend. We're in the 1980s, and the book I have for you is In the Year of the Boar and Jackie Robinson by Betty Bow Lord. I love this book so much for so many reasons. But first of all, the reason I loved it for spring was because I always think of baseball in the spring, and baseball plays so much of a role in this book. So we follow Shirley Temple Wong as she leaves China and she moves to New York and she doesn't know a, a word of English. And also because of how they count their age in China, she ends up in a grade that's higher than the grade she's actually supposed to be in. And she just has a really hard time at first. It's in May one day where she actually meets a girl who would become her best friend and they start playing baseball together. The time period is in the 1940s, I think it's 1947, and Jackie Robinson has defeated all odds and he's now playing baseball. And also there's some great history about the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Yankees that's really fun as well. 
It has great references to Nancy Drew, to the Nancy Drew mysteries. It does have a few elements that are of its time. What I love about it is that it, it helps a kid understand what another child might feel like if they're coming into the grade and they don't speak English and they need help understanding what's going on. And it gives that perspective. It was illustrated by Mark Simont, who is illustrator of the Nate the Great series, and I'll show you one of them. The chapters are all headed by a month. And this one doesn't have it, but in the version we read, which was a hardback that I got from the library, it had the Mandarin characters under each month, which was great because you can pick up the character for month, and then the way they do it is they show the, the numerical month. So like January would be the one, and then two, and three, and four, and so on. So it was kind of neat because you could pick up not only the months and how they're written, but also numbers. But yeah, I really recommend this. The end especially is wonderful. It just really brought such happiness to my heart. <laughs> Published in 1990 by Dick King Smith, I have Paddy's Pot of Gold. It's um, set in Ireland, um, not necessarily on St. Patrick's Day, but it is in the spring. And one day Bridget goes outside and she's wearing her rain boots and her rain boot has a hole in it and it's her birthday and she's turning eight years old she's an only child and it just so happens that all those circumstances are exactly what you need in order to be able to see a leprechaun and so she meets a leprechaun and this leprechaun does have a pot of gold but you don't get to it until a little bit later in the story and it's just about her friendship with this leprechaun. And it's very sweet and very endearing. If you have an only child like I do, it's a great book to read because only, only children can see a leprechaun. David Parkins is the illustrator, and this one's super cute. We've read a couple of Dick King Smith's books. I haven't yet read Babe. The pig. This one so far has been our favorite. Now we are in the 2000s and published in 2007 is The Invention of Hugo Cabret by Brian Selznick. I love this book so much. It's one of those books that can really broaden one's horizons because you learn so much about the history of cinematography and filmmaking. It's also amazing because this is one of the few chapter books if not the only chapter book, I'm not really sure, but that has won the Caldecott Medal. As you know, the Caldecott Medal is usually awarded to picture books, but this one is a huge chapter book that won the Caldecott Medal. And don't let the size of it um, keep you from reading it because it is mostly pictures. It's almost like one of those picture books that you flip like a moving picture, which I think is brilliant. Yeah, so we follow um, Hugo, who is alone. He's living in Paris in a train station in Paris, and he's looking after a clock. His father is no longer with them. And he has this automaton that he had held on to that, that was his father's, and he's trying to figure out how to fix this automaton. And he has a few items of mystery that he's also trying to figure out what they're for. Looking for a part, for this automaton that he needs to fix it and not having any money, he steals a part from a toy from this toy maker shop and this grumpy toy maker catches him and he gets in trouble for it and, and he meets the toy maker's granddaughter and they together try to solve this mystery of what this automaton is and it leads them to a very unexpected place and the, and the results are just magical. I chose it for a spring list. It's happening at the very end of winter, and then it also goes through the year a little bit later. So it's not specifically spring-like, but I chose it because it's about becoming, it's, it's about growing into what you're supposed to become, as Hugo does. And it also is about another character letting go of fears and come out from hiding for the world to see. I really love this book and I highly recommend it. It's just a lovely book. I spoke about it a little bit when I was showing you guys in another video, this nonfiction picture book I picked up called Action, because you find out a little bit more about this picture and where it came from. I really, really can't recommend Hugo enough. Now we are in the 2010s and I decided to go ahead and recommend the Wings of Fire books written by Tui T. Sutherland, illustrated by Joy Ng. I should point out there's only illustrations in the very beginning, a map and a sort of character tree. First of all, before I even begin, it's important to know that there is some violence in this book, mostly this first one. 
I'm now in book number four and book number two and book number three don't have as much violence as this very first one does. So do make sure that your kid is ready for this one. You might maybe give it a read through just to be sure. You have five dragonets and they are the dragonets of destiny and their eggs were stolen, which is by the way, a reason I thought of it as a good book for spring because so much of it revolves around their eggs and their eggs being stolen. And I always think of eggs, springtime reminds me of eggs, birds, eggs and all that. So their eggs were stolen and then they ha they hatched on a certain bright night and that's what made them part of this destiny. What I think is so valuable is that they're all different. They all have different strengths and weaknesses and they accept each other. They accept those strengths and weaknesses about each other and they're a great team. If you have a kid who may not be the most athletic child in a group or might be different in some way, that it's okay to be different, to know it's all right to be different, it's all right to be a different person, you fit in, you are a piece of the puzzle. Your specific characteristics are valuable and if everybody was a star soccer player then this world would be very meh. <laughs> That's what I love about this series is these dragonets accept each other and they accept themselves for just what they are and just what they can do. And it's also riveting. I mean, it's like I said in my dragon video, I'm buddy reading it with my son. And it's just as interesting for me as it is for him, I think. Okay, maybe a little bit more for him. He's flying through them. I mean, he's on like the 10th one and I'm only on the fourth one. And of course he reads it at school, which is where he discovered it. It's a matriarchal society and there are a lot of female dragons. It's a great series for both boys and girls. So I highly recommend it for if your child is ready for it, but it's um, just such a good series. And Joy Ang, the illustrator, I have another book illustrated by Joy Ang that my late cousin David sent to my son as a gift, and it's The Atlas Obscura, which is a wonderful book, The, the World's Most Adventurous Kid. And let me show you a couple of her illustrations. Here's one of them. And now for my final book from the 2020s, written in 2021 is Hannah Gold's The Last Bear. I really loved this book. I was so touched. I was actually going to save this for a summer list, but then I realized that this would make an amazing read for Earth Day in, on, in April. So I thought I would recommend it. And it's just a wonderful story. Um, the main character's name is April. April lives with her dad. The, her mom has passed away. Her father is doing some research and is stationed in an island in the Arctic called Bear Island where there are no longer any more polar bears. One day April is outside and she glimpses what she thinks is a very large figure. So she goes to, to figure out what she had seen and she finds a polar bear who is in trouble and she helps the polar bear out of trouble. And they have a friendship that grows. She finds ways to feed it because it's, it's suffering from uh, malnutrition so she helps it and it's just such a beautifully written book it raises environmental awareness and we just really loved it I picked this version up w during a trip to Spain I went to this one bookstore in Barcelona and it had some English books so I've got this version illustrated by Levi Pinfold and here's an illustration of his which in his illustrations are all throughout the book and they're just beautiful and black and white and Finding Bear, the second in the series, just came out in February. So I'm keen to see if I can get a copy of that one somewhere. I've usually finished these off with a graphic novel that I just really, really love. And I don't have it with me because it was booked out from the library, but I came across it when I was doing my Anne of Green Gables Illustrator Explorer in the autumn of last year. It was the Anna Green Gables graphic novel by Mariah Marsden, illustrated by Brenda Thumler, I believe. And it was so good. I really, really, really enjoyed it. I love the illustrations and they were just so beautiful and the story was told so well. So anyway, that would be my choice for my spring graphic novel. Well, that is it. Uh, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end if you're still here. I hope that I was able to keep this video under check. <laughs> I, I, I really love sharing these books with all of you guys. Um, what a great community we have here. I love this community and I just wanted to say thank you so much to the people who have mentioned my channel on their channels. I really appreciate it so much and um, especially a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, I was really having the YouTube blues. 
<laughs> and um, Laura from Why the Book Wins um, mentioned my channel, not only mentioned my channel, but mentioned a book that she had picked up as a result of my website, a Peter Pan, a version of Peter Pan. And it just made me so happy and kind of got me out of my, my little funk that I was in. And I just want to say thank you so much to Laura, but there have been others that mentioned me and I am so grateful to you. I hope you all have a wonderful start to spring. Let me know if your daffodils or your um, crocuses are starting to come up yet. And I will see you next time. Bye.